is rachelgriffith.org teaching and you go down to the bottom of that page you can download the reading list and the PDF of the slides for each of the lectures. Yep, sure, yeah. Yep. They, um, they might have some typos or something, but they are there. They are what they are. <coughs> so <coughs> if you're interested in more detail, look in the readings and the detailed papers for each of the talks is there, and that's really, really give you the more accurate information, if you like. Um, okay. Okay, so in this lecture, what um, I want to do is think a little bit more about the supply side of things. So I'm going to do two different things. One, we're going to think about ban restrictions to advertising, uh, or we could, we could talk about the difference between advertising and information. So government information campaigns are like a form of advertising, if you like, just done by the government, might be different in some ways. Um, but the motivation is sort of the same. We're still thinking about syntaxes, we're still thinking about the way that policy might improve or not improve welfare, um, but now we're thinking about regulations to advertising. And so we're going to have the same setup with some set of goods that have some social costs. And what we would like the advertising restriction to do is to reduce consumption that incurs large social costs. And so we're going to be interested in understanding, one, if we restrict advertising, does it actually lead to a reduction in consumption? It's actually going to turn out it doesn't and we'll see why, and, uh, and then two, um, uh, what, what are the welfare implications? Uh, and so, as before, we're going to be interested, the demand curve we specify is going to be really important in thinking about that, but now we're also going to think a bit about the supply side in this talk and the next talk, so what firms do. So in the, last two in the first lecture, the papers I presented, we do think about the supply side, particularly in the second one. I just didn't talk about it in the interest of time. Um, so this, these are exactly the same slides, so now we're looking at the effect of restrictions on advertising. This is a policy that I th think has been introduced in Singapore and that many countries, uh, including the UK, are thinking of expanding. We do already restrict advertising for some goods and we're thinking of increasing them. So the other thing that's going to be a bit different here when we think about the demand model is that we're going to want to think about some possible behavioral effects. So advertising uh, potentially distorts people's decision making uh, and we want to allow for that possibility. I'll talk more about that, about when we might think it does and when we might think it doesn't. But we're going to want to make sure that any demand model that we estimate can accommodate that possibility if that's something we're interested in. And when we come to think about welfare, we're going to want to be careful what we mean by welfare when consumers have sort of distorted preferences. And so we'll talk a bit about how we do that. Um, so, in all seen good markets, the typically firms advertise a lot. Maybe because they want to kind of exploit people's behavioral biases, like lack of self-control, etc. But so, if we think about goods like tobacco and alcohol, they used to be very heavily um, advertised, and now the advertising is heavily restricted. Tobacco advertising is banned. I noticed on the way here in the airport. Now in the airport. It's like a secret room in, in Heathrow. It's like a, a room behind a door with no labeling on it. It's really hard to get to the cigarettes. So they've really restricted um, to tobacco advertising. And alcohol advertising in many countries is, is heavily restricted on TV, etc. So there are calls. So already in the UK, we restrict advertising of junk foods, foods that are unhealthy, on children's TV. The US has some regulations like that too. And there's discussion about expanding that. So treating uh, foods that are high in sugar, salt, and saturated fat like we do alcohol and not allowing them to be advertised on TV. There are a whole bunch of issues I won't talk about to do with social media and how we actually implement that type of, ad of ban. But, uh, so we're thinking about advertising on TV. So ex ante, we don't know. Before we implement that kind of policy, we don't really know what the effect's going to be. It's going to depend on how demand changes with advertising. So what does advertising actually do to people's choices? So one thing there that's going to be important is advertising. Might, if you imagine Coke and Pepsi, one thing that advertising does, if I advertise Coke, it leads me to not buy Pepsi, but to be more likely to buy Coke. 
So it leads to market share, market share stealing. If that's all it did, if it didn't, so it might also lead me to buy cola as opposed to milk, right? If all it did was lead to stealing between Coke and Pepsi, then banning advertising isn't going to have any effect. The government doesn't care if you buy Coke or Pepsi. They care that you buy sugary varieties. And so if all it does is lead to competition for brand market share between firms and it has no market expanding effect, then banning advertising would have no effect on people's aggregate consumption. And there's some evidence that in these types of markets where there's a small number of goods, that's the main effect that advertising has. We'll see that it also has some market expanding effect, but in some markets it may be mainly rivalrous. But even worse, if, that, if it's mainly rivalrous and if firms compete in advertising and prices, so they have two strategic variables they compete on, if we then restrict that and we say you can no longer compete in advertising, we've reduced their costs and we've restricted them to not compete in one strategic variable, so they may well compete more in the other strategic variable, depending on how removing advertising changes the shape of demand, and that could actually lead to prices reduction if competition between in prices is greater, and price reduction would typically lead to quantity increase. So not only could advertising have no effect, it could actually lead to an expansion of the market if, um, if, if, we, if it's like a prisoner's dilemma kind of game almost, right? And there's, you know, there's, that's, we'll see some evidence of that in the market we're going to look at. The, in lecture three, I'll talk about another market where we don't see that effect. And so it really does depend on the shape of demand and the role that advertising plays in that market. How market expanding it is and what it does to consumers' price sensitivity. Um, and so, so we're going to estimate demand to learn about that. We're going to look at how firms respond to the restriction to advertising. And then we're, we're going to do some sort of counterfactual evaluation of supply and demand to think about how, what that says about the overall impact of the tax on welfare. What's going to be important, though, is something that we can't really identify in, in the data we need to assume is how we think about welfare, uh, how we think about advertising, entering into consumers' utility function. So in general, when we think about advertising, we can th the literature, um, there's a really good review by Bagwell that I put in the, in the, in the reading, advertising we typically think of as p possibly playing three different roles. One role is informative. My book good is on sale today and the price is reduced by 20%. That would be an informative advert. That's giving consumers information about the state of the market, it should increase competition, it should be um, beneficial to consumers in general. That's one role that advertising can play. Advertising could be distortionary. I'm selling you something that's very unhealthy and I'm going to have a very thin model or a sports star advertise eating it. So it's distorting you from thinking about the true characteristic and is leading you to make a decision that's not in line with your like true set of preferences, but it's like some distorted set of preferences. So we're not going to be able to identify in any sense that that's the type of advertising we're looking at, but I'll show you some adverts and I'm going to argue that in this market, we think that, it's, that advertising is distortionary. But because I can't really identify that, I don't have any strategy to tell you that's what it does, I'm also going to consider the alternative, which is we think of it as a characteristic. So that's kind of due to um, uh, models by people like Becker and Murphy that say, well, if a, if, a, if a sports star advertises a pair of trainers and you then buy those trainers, you're getting some utility because you're like that sports star. It's like that's actually an additional characteristic to the good. It's not distorting your decision making. It's giving you an additional characteristic that you get to be like that sports star. Right? And there's some utility to that. And so that's very hard to identify. There are some papers that try and identify the difference between those two. We don't have that ability here. So we're just going to look at what, what the welfare effects are under those two possible alternatives and look at the components of welfare and leave it up to the policymaker to decide what they think. I'm going to argue I think it's distortionary, but if you think it's a characteristic, then we'll give you the information to make your decisions based on that. So again, that's the things to be careful when we're doing this kind of evaluation, not to assume that, but to be clear about 
what it is we really can identify and what it is we need to assume for interpretation. So this is from a paper published in uh, the Review of Economic Studies with Pierre Dubois and Martin O'Connell. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think you've prefaced it very well, right? It's, but to me, it's very clear, right, that making a, a teenager want an expensive set of sneakers because Cristiano Ronaldo uses them, right? And now they're happy. Once they've seen the ad, they're happy because they got it. But without having seen the ad, they were happy yep. not having it. Right? It's this thing about habit, preference formation, yeah. right? And yep. it's at a philosophical level, it's yep. so I can troubling. And you yep. can preface that, yeah. right? I totally agree with you. But there's a it's a it's a it's a view in the in the literature that that yeah 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 it's the way our society yeah operates today yeah exactly yeah but there's a view among some people that that's a free market outcome and that you know if you advertising could enhance the product of a you know a some types of goods become prestige goods or something because they've been advertised and you can treat that like a characteristic. Um, and so we do need, you know, we, like I said in the last one, you know, in the last lecture, we would like to have more information on the externality function. We'd like to have more information on what advertising really does to your preferences and preference formation. That's not in this paper. I, I think that's a great thing to work on and I would love to, but that, that's not here. That, I'm just going to say this is the two possibilities and you know, um, so uh, so this says a lot. I just said in, in more detail. So policymakers are interested in encouraging. The aim of banning advertising is to encourage people to make better decisions when they choose what foods to eat. And so what we'll have to think about. And so one area of that is an unhealthy snacks. So I'm going to consider here potato chips, crisps. Um, and so thinking about um, advertising for unhealthy snacks. And we have these two, these three different views of advertising. Um, for those of you that came in late, the, the um, slides are actually online if you want to get them. They're on my website. If, you're welcome to take pictures too if you want, but in case you want them, if you go to rachelgriffith.org teaching, you can download them. So these are um, common adverts for um, crisp potato chips is the market I'll be studying today. So Gary Lineker is a football star who is shown with a bunch of uh, eating a bunch of crisps. This is a model, a famous model, uh, and then a little, you know, toy aimed at kids. So these are pretty unhealthy products. They're very high in fat and salt. And I would argue that there's not much informative in any of those adverts. And maybe it's adding, you know, Gary Lineker is a real national hero. He was a great guy. Maybe he's adding to your utility when you eat crisps doesn't seem like that's really that relevant to me. It seems to me that mainly what these are doing is saying you can eat something that's very high in fat and salt and you'll look like this and you'll be a great sports star, which is distorting you from your, um, your decision making. And so I'll show you some evidence in demand that's consistent with that story, that when people see more adverts, they pay less attention to price and they pay less attention to health characteristics. So that's not like a rigorous, that it's, we don't have a great identification strategy, but it's definitely consistent with demand being, with the advertising being distortionary. So that would be where my views would lie on this, but to be rigorous, we want to, um, so, so I'm mainly going to think about the persuasive view. So that advertising can lead consumers to act as non-standard decision makers by providing environmental cues to consumers. And so there's a bunch of work by Bernheim and others about this. And so that the idea is that choices that you make in the presence of these cues, in the presence of advert, are like not your true preferences. They're predicated on some improper processing of information. So the fact that you're distorted by thinking you're gonna be a football star like Gary Lineker, it distorts you from thinking about prices and the negative characteristics of the good in terms of health characteristics. And so when we think about the government's objective function, we don't want to evaluate your utility based on those distorted preferences. We want to evaluate your utility based on your true preferences, which are the ones that we observe when you don't experience advertising. So I'm going to be able to see those because I'm going to see people when they aren't 
um, when they don't have ad they don't see advertisements and then when they do see advertisements and I'm going to interpret that in this way I'm also going to interpret it in an alternative way and say that I can't identify that and then I'll use the distorted preferences as a true preferences on the basis that what that's doing it's not making me you know dislike price uh, dislike um, the health unhealthy consequences more it's making me it's adding a different characteristic that I value more, which is that I get to pretend like I'm Gary Lineker. Okay. Yeah. To make sure that uh, I'm understanding this properly, the government is aiming to adjust for the fact that people's preferences get distorted by these advertisements. Right? When they make decisions. So, so you, you form your value function based on the correct preferences, non distorted, but then you adjust in the second stage. You, you make your decisions with the distorted preferences, when you, but, you, but we want to evaluate your welfare on the non-distorted preferences. Right. Yeah, that will be un under the persuasive view, exactly. Whereas under the characteristics view, which I'll also show you, it's just the one that has advertising is your true preferences and there's no distortion. I see. Why are these different? Uh, Wait, because in the distorted view, so do you, you know, so they're different because do you value the advertising or not? So in the, in the persuasive view, advertising is doing a bad thing. It's leading to you not paying attention to the true things that you care about. Whereas in the characteristics view, it's like it's giving you something you value. You, and so the preference parameters are different because now suddenly this good has something that you really value. And so you value that more than you do the, you know, the other things, and so you're willing to pay more for it, right? And um, yeah, that's the difference. But you see, a lot of papers don't really take this that seriously and think carefully about how you do welfare in this. You know, so what's the which set of utility parameters do you want to use to evaluate welfare? If you're thinking about something like advertising, you need to be really careful to think about that, that precisely. Okay, so in the UK, the government regulates, um, the, the, we have regulation for foods already based on their nutrient scores. That's to do with um, whether they're allowed to be advertised on children's TV and some other types of regulations um, about where they're sold and stuff. So they use something called the nutrition profiling score, which is what we use here. It's the thing that governments use, whether it's a good score or not, who knows, but it's the thing that's used in regulation, so we'll use that. And so what this does is aggregate nutrient characteristics into a single score. So a lower score, so this nutrient score here, a lower score is a healthier product. And so it's basically, you get, each product gets points for the amount of calories, the amount of saturated fat, the amount of sodium, and for other products, the amount of sugar and the amount of other stuff in it too. Th these are the things that matter most for crisps. Um, and so as well as being interested in whether people buy potato chips or not, we're going to be interested in whether they substitute amongst these goods to the more healthy varieties. So you can see there's one variety that has a nutrient score of 10 compared to the highest one, which is 18. So if we get rid of advertising, do people substitute away from the less healthy goods to the more healthy goods? And we'll see some of that effect. So the effects of advertising are going to be both to move people to get people to not pay attention to price, to pay not so much attention to nutrients, so buy more unhealthy crisps, and also to buy more crisps. Right? And so we'll capture all of that in our demand model. So we're going to develop a model of consumer demand and oligopoly supply with multi-product firms. So in all of this, again, I haven't talked a lot about that, but these the, the interaction within the firm in pricing and advertising is going to be important because most of these firms have multiple brands and so part of what policy is going to do is shift the firm's strategies because it shifts demand within the products within the firm and so we want to we need to account for that when we think about the supply side and then we're going to allow firms to compete in price and advertising so What's going to be important is that we allow advertising to, well, one of the things that's going to be important is that we allow advertising to enter demand in a very flexible way. In a flexible way, why? Because we want it to be able to potentially, to allow the data to pick up all those things I said at the beginning. 
that maybe advertising is rivalrous, it, it brings market share from the other firm, maybe it expands the market, maybe it distorts behavior, maybe it's informative, maybe, actually we're not going to allow it to be informative, maybe it's a characteristic that people value. So I need to make sure that the demand model I specify allows for all of that. So again, the standard way we include, if you just include advertising linearly in the utility, it's not going to do all that. It's not going to allow it to both expand the market and be rivalrous. You're going to impose a lot on that. So we need to make sure that we include advertising um, and it's not going to allow, it's not going to, it wouldn't allow for distortion of people's preferences over different characteristics. So we're going to have to be careful in the way we include it and demand that it allows for all of that. The other thing about advertising is that we tend to think it has long lasting effects. So advertising today is not only going to affect demand today, it's going to affect demand into the future. So that consumers' decision making isn't just a function of like the adverts they saw today, it's a function of the stock of adverts that they've seen over some time period. Maybe that depreciates with time, but we're going to, there's going to be dynamics in that supply. So in this lecture, I'm going to write down that fully dynamic model, but then we're going to consider a ban. So the nice thing about the ban is we don't need to solve the dynamic model. We just solve the static pricing game. And then because we're banning advertising, all the dynamic stuff goes away. And so we can do our counterfactual of a ban without having to solve the full dynamic model. In the last lecture, I'm going to talk about a similar type of model for soft drinks where, we solve the, where we're interested in policies where we don't fully ban advertising, but maybe we restrict it. And we're going to be interested in the um, in the solving the supply game. So that's in general going to be really hard to do, and we'll have some tricks to figure out how we do that. Um, so we're going to estimate this on the model for potato chips in the UK crisps, um, and then simulate the impact of a ban on on advertising on equilibrium outcomes like prices, expenditures, quantity, and nutrition. And I said because the ban because it's a full ban we don't need to solve the dynamic supply equilibrium. And then we're going to consider welfare under these different assumptions. OK, so when we think about how advertising enters demand, we want to make sure that we allow for cooperative and rivalrous effects of advertising, such that an increase in advertising of one brand may increase demands for other brands. So that's like cooperative or expansionary advertising. It could decrease demand for another brand, it has some predatory effects, and, so, and then it could lead overall to a whole expansion in the market or a contraction in the market. And then we want to allow for these dynamic effects in saying that the advertising, that what's going to matter to consumers is the current advertising state, which is a function not of only of the advertising they saw today, but the advertising they've seen in the past. So the consumer's payoff or decision utility, so I'm going to be careful here now not to call it utility, because this is now, I'm writing down the function that determines the choice that the consumer made, but I don't at this point want to say whether it's their like true experience utility or it's their decision utility, which is like distorted by the effects of advertising. So typically in like Bernheim's work, they call that decision utility versus experience utility, or you might call it like the payoff you get, meaning like the instantaneous payoff you get when you make the decision. And so the point of that being that advertising is gonna enter that decision, but when it comes to thinking about welfare, we may not want to enter advertising into that if it's distortionary. So again, we're going to have the brands, we're going to have pack size, so one of the margins that consumers can substitute along is to shift up and to smaller pack sizes or bigger pack sizes. So the over, we're going to be interested in like, the choice you make in terms of the nutritional intensity, how healthy is the product, but we're also going to be interested in the quantity that the individual consumes because that's from a health perspective, that's what we care about. So we're going to allow people to shift up and down that yeah, I might just buy a bigger pack or a smaller pack, I might buy more of a particular brand. Um, and so we're going to write this in some very general form where these functions are telling me that I'm going to allow them to interact. So the first term is like advertising and price. So advertising is potentially going to be um, distorting people's prices 
the attention they pay to a negative characteristic. And it's also potentially going to shift the demand curve in a way that might change consumers' price responsiveness. And so that may will have effects on firms' optimal pricing decisions. Right? So when we think about the supply side, that will matter. Because what firms are going to care about is people's decision utility, not their true utility. Then the second term is the nutrient quality. So again, we're going to have advertisement interacted with that in a way that allows uh, advertising potentially to distort people from paying attention to the health characteristics um, and we'll let the data tell us to what extent that's true then advertising is going to enter uh, in itself and that that gamma this function here this AT is a function of all the advertising states for all the brands so we're gonna uh, need to contract that space, that state space is very large, but we're going to have, you know, your own advertising can affect your brand, but then a rival's advertising can also affect your brand. And we're going to impose some common, we're not going to let every firm's rival uh, advertising to affect every firm in different ways, we'll impose some common coefficients over that. Um, and then there's a pack size and we're interacted with some unobservables. And all of these coefficients have I subscripts, which are going to be modeled by, um, by random, uh, uh, random coefficients. So we're back to the random coefficients world here. So it's interesting to me how you enter advertising into the system over here in terms of the fact that that AT vector is not only self-advertising, it's also other things. Because I've thought of the problem of price in a similar way. You can theoretically argue the same thing for price, right? that every item's price also affects your own price yeah my own my utility for a particular item um, yeah conceptually why would you do it only my own price in the utility form um, for price but all other items is uh, advertising properties and in fact more generally so all the prices enter into people's choice um, just from the before, oh yeah more generally also for uh, general product characteristics why would you not include just like you included the entire state for advertising other product characteristics also in my uh, utility form because that also affects my inherent utility for an item I think. yeah so in a discrete choice demand model ev all the other prices and characteristics are going to enter into your choice because you're making a comparison your decision is so they're entering in that way Advertising here, we're entering as um, to allow for the possibility that advertising is market expanding. So the idea being that I see an advert for Pepsi, that makes me think, oh, I really fancy a cola, and then I go and buy Coke. It's not telling me only about Pepsi, it's telling me ah, cola is nice compared to milk. Right? And so it's allowing the effect of advertising. So why do we do that? Because there's a ton of theory that suggests that that's the effects that advertising has, where I don't know of any theory that suggests that me seeing another price affects what I, my evaluation of the utility of this good, except for in just the comparison of which good. Okay, so the theory point is like you yeah. make distinction from... Yeah, so, so maybe there would be other characteristics at advertising that had that that uh, maybe like some kind of labeling or something. I guess I could think of that. I'm not aware of that and that's not what we're focusing on here. So, but you, yeah, so the, like all the other prices do affect your decision, but they're not changing your evaluation of the utility of this good. So seeing the price of Coke doesn't change my evaluation of the utility of Pepsi. When I decide between Coke and Pepsi, I compare the prices, so that enters my decision, but it doesn't directly change my, whereas seeing an advert for Pepsi does affect, could potentially affect my decision about the utility of Coke, because it makes me think, mmm, yummy, cola, right? And so that's the idea of advertising, that it may not just, the effect of advertising may be to bring people into the market, as opposed to bring you to that particular good. Yeah. Yeah. So then, yes, but then, so that's not in this model. But if you had that as a theory, then you would want to think about that. So this is a theory, right? 
Exactly, that's right. And so if you had a theory that that changed the utility, then you would want to it. And so something like anchoring could do that, and you'd want to think carefully. If, so if you were trying to study the effects of anchoring, you'd really want to think about that. Here we're interested primarily in advertising, so we're not going to put everything in. But that, exactly, that would be, yeah, so if, if you, so we have, th like, that's an interesting question. So once we did try and look at, you know, the position of things in the supermarket. So if the fact that I, that the, um, like a, a healthy product, a, a medium healthy product is placed next to unhealthy products, changes your evaluation of the nutrients compared to if it's placed amongst all the healthy ones and it's the least healthy, that would be like an anchoring where you would want to know of the goods around it. Did it look more healthy or less healthy, right? That would exactly be, um, well, this comes like what we were talking about at lunch when you tell, when you get your utility bill and it tells you your like below average consumer of electricity, you, there's some suggestion that maybe you increase your electricity consumption because you're like, <laughs> oh, I'm really much better than everyone else at green at, at emissions. So, you know, so how that information anchors your view of where you are. No, uh, no, it's quantity. It's got quantity too. So in the end, we're going to be doing quantity. Is there going to be the outcome variable that I'm interested in? So we have um, in here uh, the pack size. So there's two. So so there's two ways in which the quantity decision is embedded in this in, in all of the models I'm showing you. One is the frequency with which you purchase. So here we're going to be looking at weekly purchases on a main shopping trip. And so if you purchase every week, you're going to get a lot. Whereas if you purchase every other week, you will have, um, you know, you'll get, the quantity is going to be less. And we, that is embedded in the model. So we're going to have a fixed periodicity of the decision. And so if you purchase less often, that's going to show up in the probability with which you purchase, and that will be the big. That will actually be the biggest effect on quantity. In addition, you may substitute. Ad advertising may lead you to pa purchase a bigger pack size, and um, and and so that would increase the quantity. So in the end, I'll look at. It's not just the market share; it's the aggregate. And, but that's like super important because of exactly what I was saying. If you want to capture market expanding, if you had a demand model that didn't include an outside good and that didn't include pack size, you wouldn't be able to capture market expanding because you would only be looking at the market share, which is abstracting from that. So that's absolutely key. So, yeah. so I haven't really paid, a, I said that before, but I haven't really paid a ton of attention to the outside good. But for that reason, if you're interested in like a, um, if, if you're interested in a quantity outcome, you really need to think carefully about the definition of the outside good because that's going to have a huge effect on what you, um, on, on the quantity that you predict from this. Okay, so, uh, so then, so I just wrote those as general functions and then I'm going to have to specify exactly what um, each of those functions look like. So price, so if we look at advertising and price, this is going to be key the way this enters because I'm interested in whether advertising changes the shape of demand and changes the attention people pay to, to price because I'm interested in how firms reprice and this like distortionary effect. So it's going to come in through this like there's going to be a, a, a price preference parameter that's going to be I specific through and that's going to be a random coefficient and then there's going to be an advertising times price coefficient that's also going to have a random coefficient on it. Then similarly with um, X, whatever X was, nutrients. So similarly with nutrients, people are going to have like preferences over nutrients that are going to be allowed to vary, but then advertising is potentially going to shift those preferences for nutrients. And then the advertising is going to enter as the effect of the brand itself, B is brand. So the, um, I keep on saying Coke and Pepsi, but this is crisp. So Walker's crisp advertising is going to affect Walker's but then the advertising by all the other firms is also going to affect it. So here we're making the assumption that 
every other firm's advertising has the same effect on you. We're not allowing for a differential effect of one brand versus another. We could do that, then you get a lot of parameters. It's, that's a decision we had to make. And then all of these coefficients are going to have um, a random coefficient such that they vary with demographics and they vary uh, it with randomly with some unobservable. So we're going to have like um, the demographics are going to be like household composition as the kids in the house and income. And so we're going to allow the whole distribution of the random coefficients to shift with that. It's going to be different for households with kids. are going to have a different distribution of the random coefficients to old people, pensioner households, for example. And that's going to be true for all of those random coefficients. Um, yeah. Yeah, so that's basically what I just said. So it's really important that we include the competitor advertising effect because that's going to be what's key to allowing um, the possibility of it having some expansionary effect or rivalrous effect. Um, and it's really important that we included those interactions to allow for this, dis this distortionary effect. Yeah. So um, the, the price coefficient now, you have PBS, D, so you have price by the pack size. Brand and size, yeah. Um, so we have nonlinear pricing in the UK, so I, which is unusual. Is the, the demand model that I have a problem understanding the meaning of the price coefficient when you have like different size items um, enter as their own price things because I don't understand how price normalization works in that case. Um, so it's either price per, per gram or whatever, or you control for size, in which case that would do the same thing. So this is, so this is price per, so think of it, I can't remember which we do here, but this, think of it as price per uh, amount. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, and so the point is, the reason we do this, so like in the US, that, would be, that wouldn't make any sense to do because it's pretty much linear pricing in the US. So there's very little price variation per gram along the pack size. That's not true in the UK for reasons that I sort of partially understand, partially but just empirically, there's a lot of nonlinear pricing in the UK. So the price per gram varies a lot with different pack sizes. So if you have price per gram over here and you have like an alpha, um, your, your taste parameter for price, you would also multiply by the quantity. Yeah, exactly. I, th I, can't, I can't actually remember which we do or whether we control for quantity, but the effect is the same. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, no, that's a good question. Okay, so this is the same um, setup as before, and I won't, this is very standard, so I won't go through that, but so basically it's a discrete choice demand model, so consumers evaluate their decision utility for each good, and then the probability of purchasing is given by the standard um, logic, multinomial logics or integrating over the different um, uh, um, random coefficients and that gives us the aggregate market share that the firm faces. So, um, well I'll just say this again because it's so important, sorry I obviously wanted to make sure that you, <laughs> I've said it already lots of times, but just that the importance, so we, um, so in the paper we go to some effort to show you how the, um, the way that we enter advertising affects the demand, the price, the, both the price and the advertising elasticity in ways that allow the data to allow us to identify how advertising shifts demand as opposed to imposing it through a functional form. So it's much more standard to just include advertising in a rather limited way and if you then looked at what that implied about the elasticities it would impose for example rivalrousness or it would impose some much more restricted form. And so that's important to think about. Okay, so to show you, so we estimate the model, like in all of these, I'm not showing you a bunch of coefficient estimates because in general, there's like a ton of coefficients. So we, so we have one, a lot of data, but in general, in these kind of models, you end up with quite a lot of coefficients and they're not that informative when you look at them. So I'll instead show you some, uh, um, some estimates of consumers' willingness to pay for uh, nutritions. So the idea of that being looking at how does advertising affect consumers' willingness to pay for nutrients and then some advertising elasticities. 
And so what we're interested in, the willingness to pay for more nutritious food is potentially affected by advertising, given this expression. And so we may be interested in whether that increases or decreases with A, and that's with, with advertising. And what's important is that that's given by coefficients that we estimate. It's not assumed by the model. So like whenever you're writing down a model and estimating it, it's really useful to like write out the derivative and see what that's determined by to ensure that you're allowing sufficient flexibility to allow the data to be telling you the sign and magnitude of that as opposed to assuming it from the functional form. Okay, so, so we'll do that and I'll show you some of those estimates. Those are things we can learn about from demand and so just estimating demand might be interesting because it'll tell us how advertising affects consumers. But we're also interested in thinking about the supply side. So we've got some multi-product firms here that compete by setting two strategic variables, both price and advertising. And so the thing that we're really interested in is if we restrict advertising, what happens in the market in terms of price competition? Um, and so that's a, in general, that's a complicated problem because firms, that's a dynamic problem for the firm because advertising today affects advertising tomorrow. Here, because we're considering a ban, that makes it simple. But in the next lecture, we'll think about the more complicated model. So the problem is complicated because firms uh, have to solve this you know, intertemporal profit function. Um, and so they're going to need to, you know, in, in choosing expenditure today, they're going to think about the impact that has on the future profits, next period, period after, period after, and that becomes a very difficult problem to solve. However, um, so I'm going to say, well, so, so in this paper, we write down the firm's full uh, dynamic problem. I'm not going to use that until lecture three, so I think I'll, I'll postpone talking about that in much detail until lecture three. But um, so the point being here, we can write a fully complete, we're, we're not making any assumptions about the supply behavior of firms. We're allowing firms to behave in a very um, unrestricted way. It's just because we're considering a ban, we can derive the pricing first order conditions without having to deal with all of that messy supply stuff. So the reason we write down the full supply model in the paper is to make that point that it's not. And so again, it's like the behavioral point I made that I could write down that, that demand model that I wrote down and say, I'm going to assume firms uh, that advertising is distortionary and I'm going to like impose this structure. I'm going to assume that advertising is rivalrous and have some restricted structure. I don't want to do that. I want to be really careful to write down the model in such a way that I'm imposing as little as I can realistically on the, the structure of the problem and allowing the data to tell me what the things I'm most interested in. So here, so I'm not going to use any of this me mechanics until the next lecture, um, but we write it down to point out to you that we can have the firms solving this much more complicated um, dynamic model um, where um, we make some set of assumptions and those are perfectly consistent with what we're estimating. Okay, but the nice thing is that we can solve this without, um, without having to deal with all of this. So why is that? Because we can write, because what we're interested in is shutting off advertising and then looking at how prices respond. And because we've, ass so we've assumed that advertising is, so there's like dynamics in the supply side, Advertising today affects advertising tomorrow, but we've assumed that there's no dynamics in the demand side. So like prices today don't affect prices tomorrow. So we can derive the, f the price first order condition only depends on this static uh, first order condition. So we can identify firms marginal costs um, without solving for the full complicated dynamic uh, value function. So in these discrete choice models like the, one of the big insights of the Barry Levinson and Paikis paper in 1995 was that you can um, estimate, estimate a demand model like this and you observe and then you, the, a big unknown, so if you want to do counterfactual analysis, what you don't know is firms' marginal costs. So in general, we don't observe firms' marginal costs. We observe prices and quantities and, and demand, but we don't observe the costs. So if we want to look at how they re-equilibriate uh, re prices, we can't do that without having a, 
an estimate of marginal cost. But if we write down the first firm's first order condition, we observe everything else except for costs. So we can use that first order condition to back out costs. So that was like one of the big things that Nevo and B, that BLP and Nevo pointed out. So we, this, is the, this is the derivative of the um, demand, basically, the share of the firm, the, the market share that the firm has uh, with respect to price. So that's something we've estimated in the demand model. We observe prices. And this is the, um, a, a function of the demand model too. So we observe everything here and we can just solve this for marginal costs. And under the assumption that in any equilibrium we consider, marginal costs remain constant, we can do counterfactual analysis where we you know, change the A state variable and look at what the new optimal prices are for the firm because we observe everything else here. So what's nice about this, the insight of what we've done here is to say, well, okay, that's a really complicated dynamic problem, but because we can write this down, this is a static condition, we can solve this if we put A to zero because that removes all of the dynamics. Yeah. So I didn't quite hear the last bit of that. Um, and my current choice affects my future choice because I don't want to switch products. Yeah, so that's what I just said. So I've assumed that um, there's dynamics in supply so that firms think about the effects of advertising both to, into the future when they make decisions, but there's no dynamics in demand. So that's an assumption we've made. So in general, there may be all sorts of reasons that there's dynamics in demand from uh, consumers stockpile when things go on sale. There's all sorts of reasons that demand might be dynamic. We're not accounting for that here. So in most papers, we solve one problem, but we don't solve all problems. So if you also had dynamics and demand, this would be a mess and I wouldn't know how to solve the problem. So it's like, I'll spend all of next lecture talking about how to deal with dynamics and supply, which we've probably paid less attention to in a lot of the, but uh, dynamics in demand are also interesting and there's lots of papers on that. That's not this paper. I guess one thing we do, so we do talk about that a lot in the paper. Um, the, uh, there's not a, so much, so in the US, there's a lot of evidence for stockpiling. There's a lot of evidence that if people go to the store and something's on sale, they purchase more and then they delay their other purchases till further in the future. So if people just purchase more, that's just a price response. But the fact that people purchase more and then delay purchase, that suggests that you're stockpiling. And so there's some, what you're going to buy tomorrow is affected by prices yesterday. So there's some dynamics in demand. There's much less evidence for that in the UK. Houses are much smaller. People go shopping much more frequently. In the US, people go shopping like every over, uh, less than every two weeks. In the UK, people go shopping like every five days on average. So there's much less stockpiling. That's not to say it's not still interesting to look at dynamics and demand, but it's a less relevant empirical issue. And uh, so we don't look at it. Okay, so then we're interested in looking at the ban of advertising. So what that means is we're gonna sub um, consider a counterfactual where we put advertising to zero. And so the new equilibrium will then be Con, uh, the firms playing this, national, setting prices according to this first order condition, where now we're evaluating it. So we're going to compare, you know, when we evaluate this at the existing, holding the existing set of advertising states fixed, and then we're going to set them all to zero and, and evaluate what, pri what optimal prices would be in that equilibrium, right? Um, so one thing to note is that um, that would be worrying if we never observed advertising being at the state of zero. So doing counterfactuals that are like far outside of anything you ever observe in the data is something you really need to worry about. Particularly if you think about like these nonlinear demand models, like the, the way that if you do that, you're kind of projecting the demand system to extreme values. and where there's no data, we like aren't identifying the shape of demand very well. So you have to really believe in the functional form assumptions you make to believe that you've got the shape of demand right outside of the range you ever observe. So whenever you do counterfactual analysis, you want to think about that. Same thing with taxes. If you impose a tax that moves prices to a place that you never see in the data, 
then you want to worry about whether you're really able to project to that you know, outside of the current state. And so you, you, like sometimes we'll even just look at the shape of the demand curve to see that it's not doing something funny at the extremes. So here, we're like, we do actually have, we observe advertising states of zero with some frequency. There's some products that are never advertised and all products are not advertised for some periods. So the stock has to be zero, so it's not like the stock actually goes to zero, but it goes to very low. So we, did, we have checked that and look, um, but that's and something that's quite important. Um, and, and so it's just related to that. So we can check, so it could be that if you move to some extreme like that, that it may be that products become unprofitable and firms would want to exit them. And so we check those conditions, yeah. It's amazing how long the I.O. literature has taken to look at first order conditions in advertising, right? Yeah. Uh, at least since um, the 90s, right? Uh, prices. So I mean, that's, that's very amazing you know, you've done this. So the um, part is because advertising is hard to observe. Yeah. Right? Now you obviously observe advertising, right? You've got this data. Um, so how do you deal with you're talking about advertising stock? Yeah. When do you initialize? Yeah, so I'm gonna talk about that in a minute. So we'll initialize so we have some periods of time. Yeah, yeah, no, we totally have to make some choices and we'll in both of this lecture and the next one that'll be a key thing of what we do and I'll, I'll talk very specifically about that. So just now in fact. Um, so the data is like the Kantar data that I talked about before. So we use um, 2009, 2010. So we use information where we observe purchases both at home and on the go. Yeah. So when you talk about observing some situations where there's near zero advertising, yep. how endogenous is that with pricing decisions? Is that more like a banned situation where you couldn't advertise or would judge? No, no, it's, uh, so there's, um, I'll talk about them in a second, but there's um, store brands, there's like generic brands that don't advertise. So there's some brands that just never advertise, not because they're banned, just because they don't advertise because they're, the nature of them, they're cheap, low, low price. And then uh, if you look at, price, at advertising strategies, I'll show you a picture of it in a minute, it's very common across all, you get these pulsing strategies. So most brands like advertise a lot for a while and then they don't advertise for a long time and then they advertise again. That's a very common, so it means that individual people get low stocks. The other thing is that we'll have some people who don't ever watch the kind of TV that this is advertised on, so those individuals will have stocks of zeros. So those three kind of things. So one could, I mean, the reason I raise it is because one could debate all of those, uh, you know, and whether, there's, whether there's a sufficient flexibility in what we estimate, but we at least pay attention to it and we at least like document that there are some zeros. That doesn't mean we, everything, like, because I'm talking about it, it means it's a question. If it wasn't a question, I wouldn't be talking about it. <laughs> but, 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 you, but it's much, what we do is much better than if I just estimated it without even looking at whether it was ever zero and then projected outside of it. And so just like the, in the paper, so we, we look at the shape of demand and we check whether actually some products would want to exit if they, couldn't, if they didn't advertise. And so it's important to do those kind of checks, I think. It's still something we have to argue, absolutely. Uh, for sure, but we do at least argue it. Um, so we have both purchases at home and on the go. Again, that matters here because a lot of uh, crisps are purchased outside of the home. Um, and so we estimate like the market demand model is the aggregation of those two. So we estimate, they're also very different products. The, the set of products is very different between the two, not the brands, but like the pack sizes and stuff. So we estimate those, and when we think about the firm's pricing decision, it takes account of the market demand, which includes both of those. Um, the transactions at the individual barcode level, and we have a bunch of household information. Okay, so these are the kind of products. So we have like different brands with different pack sizes, and then those are their market shares and the prices. So there's a bunch of variation in all of that. When we look at food, this isn't all the products, it's just a sample of them. There's 26 products at home and then 11 products on the go. And they, some firms have much bigger market shares in one market than the other. Um, so the other thing that means though, that's a bit of an aside, which I probably won't talk about a lot here, but is um, there's whole literature on choice set. So, so when you estimate a discrete choice demand model, you're relying on revealed preference arguments. You're saying, I observed you go in, 
You chose, there was 10 things you could buy, you chose one that's revealing to me that you preferred the set of characteristics in that one compared to all the others. So essential in that argument is that you, you had the choice amongst all of those things. If you had a restricted choice set, then that means you can't infer that you prefer those characteristics over that characteristic because you, um, you don't see the person making that revealed preference. So there's several different things you can do about that. That's very related to advertising. There's some literature that actually models the role of advertising as changing people's choice set. In fact, one of the papers, I have a paper that's looked at uh, demand for chocolate bars where there's like 20,000 chocolate bars, no, it's 200 chocolate bars. And, and you can see that one of the things advertising does is change the set of goods that people choose from. So in an, an if, if that's not your main interest uh, in any empirical application, it can be useful to you if you know the choice set that the consumer faces and it differs. So here we know that it differs a bit by store, by the type of store. We know the type of store the consumer goes in and some goods are available in some stores and not in other stores. And so what that does is give us variation in the set of, it's useful for identification because sometimes if you assume that store choice is exogenous, sometimes the consumer's facing one menu of prices and menu of goods and then sometimes they're facing another one. And that gives you very useful variation if you think that's exogenous. So in this paper, we argue that your choice of store is exogenous. It's the same argument we had with, with in soda. It's a, low, it's a low value product. You're not gonna go shopping around to save you know, three pence for a packet of crisps. You're gonna go into a store and buy the one that's there, among the set that's there. So you can use that variation to actually help you with identification. If you don't account for that though, you're gonna, nest, you're gonna bias your estimates um, and you can bias them to a zero and the, there's all sorts of problems could arise. So one of the papers uh, in the references actually looks at that problem in more detail. So here we have some nice variation in the choice sets across those. Uh, so how are we gonna, uh, advertising is, um, so from the firm's point of view, what we observe, so we're gonna observe advertising at the individual advert level and I'll come to talk about that in a second, but from the firm's point of view, what we're modeling here is the advertising expenditure it chooses for each brand in each month. In the next lecture, I'm going to talk in much more detail about that problem and how firms do that um, and why we want to simplify that here. Just accept that for now for here. So um, that's going to include all advertising for crisps in, in all media. And so the decision of the firm is just the aggregate amount of expenditure. And then just right for now, there's a black box about how that gets allocated to individual consumers, which I'll come back to. So we're going to compute that stock as just a moving average, you know, so with some depreciation rate. In the paper we talk a lot about, we, we, in principle we can estimate that depreciation rate. We do some kind of grid search and fit, whatever. And we have several years prior to the data we estimate demand on. So we observe advertising for much longer and so we build that stock up so it comes to some uh, stationary process. Is, th is that what you were asking about before? Yeah. Okay. Um, and so we observe a lot of variation and the amount of advertising that different firms do, both across brands and across time. So the first thing you notice here is that in each month, everyone sometimes has months where they don't advertise at all. So that's gonna help us with this identification problem of zeros. And then some brands are advertised much more than others. Um, so Pringles is advertised a lot, especially compared, it's a pretty small brand thing, so per quantity that's advertised by far the most. Uh, and Walker's advertises a lot, so, but then there's also these store brand products that effectively don't advertise. Um, they're much cheap, they're much lower price, and they, um, they're like more generic kind of brands. And so all of that variation is gonna both help us identify price, uh, but it's gonna really help us with the zeros. So I said we allow all the random coefficients to vary um, by demographics. So the demographics we're gonna use are whether there's kids in the house, whether they're pensioners, the household's pensioners, then sometimes kids purchase out on the, on the go on their own. Uh, the kind of socioeconomic 
well, is the parent in the house uh, high skilled or low skilled and what's their, in their equivalized income? And so we have a lot of people in both of those and we're going to estimate it's the same group of people at home and on the go, basically. So that's to say that we have a lot of data and a ton of demographics. That's what that says. So where are we getting identification from? So for prices, the price variation is what I said before, is that you go in, there's two forms of price variation we're using. One, there's this nonlinear pricing that differs across brands and, the, and, and differs differentially across time. So some firms sometimes will you know, increase the price of the big pack size relative to the small pack size and then they'll do differently at different times. Um, and then secondly, consumers are buying in different stores and the menu of prices that they're, observe, that they're facing in different stores varies both because the stores have different pricing strategies and because the set of goods that they have available to them are differ. differ. We make some, we're only, when we do the pricing equilibrium, we're assuming that the manufacturer in, uh, sets the price and there's like some fixed negotiated markup at the retailer level. So we're not like modeling retailer, differ, even though we have differential pricing by retailer, we're not modeling them. Okay, so then advertising variation comes from the fact, so, so the firm's decision is how much it spends each month. But for the demand, what identifies it is that each consumer, so we observe every individual advert on TV. So there's like millions of adverts on TV every day. Uh, and we observe information about the household and the TV shows they typically watch, the TV stations they typically watch, and the time of day they watch. And so we can match those to each other and say the probability that a consumer saw a particular ad given the probability that they watch that show or watch TV at that time. And so that gives us idiosyncratic variation if you assume that that differences in TV viewing behavior is exogenous to demand shocks for crisps, which we'll argue it is. We also do some control function stuff. That, so. But so this is an example of the kind of variation that we use in advertising. Um, so if you look at those like, um, Coronation Street and Holyoaks are two soap operas in the UK. They're kind of pretty similar to each other. The kind of demographic of people that watch them are pretty similar. They're like a rubbishy kind of soap opera thing that, you know, the same types of people are going to watch the same types of show. But just some people happen to watch one and some people happen to watch other. And so there's two forms of variation that come from that. One is that Walkers and Pringles advertise, so if you are a Holyoke watcher, you're going to get different exposure at any moment in time to Pringles versus Walkers because of the timing of the advertise on that show. But then there's going to be some people that happen to be Holyoke watchers and some people that happen to be Coronation Street watchers that have very similar demographics, but they're going to get different exposure. So the thing that we always worry about is that if firms want to target certain demographics. They know who their consumers are, and so firms were going to choose to advertise at times when the demographic will be watching. So we need to control for all of that. So we have a bunch of fixed effects that control for how much you watch TV and people's demographics, because we know that's something that, can, that the firms are going to target. But, but the idea is that we think that this kind of variation, conditional on those controls, is exogenous that you just happen to be a Coronation Street watcher versus a Holyoke watcher. And this is one example, but you know, it's also, do you watch Tottenham or Arsenal on TV? Do you watch X Factor or Britain's Got Talent? So there's a whole bunch of shows where the demographics are similar, and so we get that variation that's as good as random. So Rachel, yeah. such pulse advertising as you mentioned. Yeah. And, and as you said, that, that, that Delta, the, yeah. Which makes it five. Yeah. So we estimate the delta parameter, but we hold it fixed across like brands and time. It's one common parameter. So that so we do estimate it. We do a grid search over it. It's like near to the right. Yeah. It, it, in the end, if you hold it common, it doesn't actually make that much difference. It changes like the actual number we're going to get in terms of welfare or quantity, but it doesn't change the, any of the conclusions of the relativities. Is there a 25% depreciation a, a month? Exactly. Like month yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, 
you know, what we found in all the work that we've done is that it doesn't, the, the level of that is not a first order issue. What would matter is if it differed. So if Pringles had a different depreciation rate to Walker's, or if you had a different depreciation rate to me, um, and we're assuming like a lot of continuity in that. And so there are models that are like, maybe it matters that you saw two ads and every ad after that has some satiation. You know, so we, so one, one could debate that function all day. No, so we have worried about it a lot, but I, in the end we concluded that, it, absolutely, there's papers to be written about that. And in the marketing literature, there are papers about that. Um, that's not our contribution. Right? Yeah, that's kind of they have a sense of, we did a campaign last month. Yeah, sales, right? maybe they do. So not sure. Don't think they know as much as we think they do, but yeah, but anyway. Just like a sort of a yeah, yeah. So that's within, you know, in that literature, it's within the range. In the next paper I talk about, uh, in the next lecture, uh, we're going to use 0.9. Again, it's, that's what we estimate when we do a grid search. But, but, but all I mean by that is like we put in different values and look at how the model fits. And honestly, we choose the one that has the best fit, but it's not that different from any other one. It's different than 0.1, but it's not that different from 0.8, you know. And for the for the relative effects of what I'm going to say, it doesn't make any difference at all. It's just the, the actual number changes, but the, you know, the direction of things doesn't change at all. Okay, so what does advertising do to demand, just before we get into supply at all? So one thing it does, and so this is kind of, this, this is not identifying that advertising is distortionary, but it's consistent with the idea that advertising is distortionary. So one thing that, um, this is looking at the change in demand if advertising expenditure is set to zero, holding all else equal. So, um, oh sorry, I, well, this is nothing to do with distortionary. This is just the effect of advertising. Uh, the next slide is. So this is just saying if Walkers sets its advertising to zero, demand for Walkers is going to go down, but demand for Pringles is going to go up. Similarly, Pringles sets its ad, people respond a lot more. So Pringles advertises a lot, so reducing its um, expenditure really leads to a big reduction, but it's going to lead to some substitution to other goods. Um, and uh, sorry, this bottom one is the total market. So for all of them, they advertising has some market expanding effect. So it has a rivalrous effect, but it has some small expanding effect. So the size of the overall market goes down to. Um, all right, so this, so now we're getting, so, so what's, what effects does advertising have on people's other preference parameters? So this is comparing what happens if we, what's the price elasticity? If we look at advertising at the observed level of expenditure that Walker's regular advertises, this is the biggest company, and compare that to if we set advertising to zero. And so what you see is that always this leads to an increase in the absolute price elasticity. So consumers become more price elastic. And uh, these are co uh, confidence intervals, so these are all, almost all statistically significant. So one of the things that advertising does is distract you from paying attention to price, because when we stop advertising, you become more price sensitive. And that's gonna be one of the f ways in which that feeds through into the supply side. And that's true for all of these goods. The other thing we then see is we interacted advertising with willingness to pay with, with uh, the uh, nutritional score. And so we can ask, so how does um, advertising affect your willingness to pay for a point reduction in the nutritional score, which is like better nutrients. So what's your willingness to pay for a one point reduction? Remember the variation was from 10 to 18. So that's like a reasonably small change in the nutritional score. So it, uh, when there's no advertising, people are much more willing to pay for more nutritious food. When advertising is high, they pay almost no attention to the nutritional value. Uh, in fact, it, here they, um, they, they reduce, they, they not only pay less attention to it, they shift more towards the less nutritional goods. They're the more heavily advertised. Um, so those taken together, again, they don't identify that advertising is distortionary, but they're consistent with the idea because they lead people to pay less attention to the negative characteristics of the good. 
Okay, so then we, so we use the demand, the first order condition from the demand model to estimate the marginal costs, and then we can do some um, simulated counterfactuals. So first I'll do is I'll look at what happens if we ban advertising, but we hold prices fixed at what they are. So that's sort of like, that's the naive direct effect of banning advertising. And I think when you talk to policymakers, that's the one they kind of think about what's gonna happen. And then we look at what happens if, you, uh, if prices respond, and then um, we'll check some stuff that I won't talk about, but this is, we'll check whether any product becomes unprofitable such that it would exit, and no products do. They're all still profitable. So I just showed you, so banning advertising leads to a toughening of price competition. So price elasticities increase in absolute terms. So that means that the average price in the market falls by 9%. So the pricing response differs across firms and products. So big advertisers uh, get, face lower prices. For instance, Walker's reduces its price by um, something like 28%. And uh, for the smaller size and 20% for the bigger size. So, um, there's, and there's no product X, I said that already. Okay, so what, so what happens then if we compare the pre-ban to the post, to what happens when we ban advertising if we have no pricing response and then if we allow the pricing response? So, um, we ban advertising, people's expenditure reduces. So people now pay more attention to price. They're no longer distorted by the advertising, so they reduce their consumption. Quantity reduces as well. People shift to the outside good, and they shift down. They become more price sensitive to uh, bigger goods, and they shift down the quantity distribution. The probability of selecting potato chips is very small. It goes up a little bit, but not a ton and then the mean um, pack size declines. So overall, you know, if we don't allow firms to reprice, the effect of banning advertising is to reduce quantity, as we'd expect that people now are more paying more attention to price, they're paying more attention to nutrients, those are both negatives, so that's leading them to, um, to, to reduce quantity. They don't do that by the full, but you know, the, there's some mitigating effects that work in the other direction because partly it's market stealing, but it does lead to people to move outside of the market. When we allow firms to change prices though, now consumers are more responsive to prices and firms aren't able to compete in advertising, so they, they lower their prices. Um, and also, one thing I didn't emphasize, but in that market, so we had like a small number of big branded products, and then we have a group of uh, store brand products, which have pretty small market shares. But because the, adver the heavily advertised branded goods are, you know, people are, the, the advertising affects their valuation and, and discourages them from looking at price, their higher price goods. So people are much more likely to buy those high branded products. Once the branding, once advertising disappears, those products don't have the same advantage. They become much more close substitutes to the store brand goods. Their price falls by a lot, so from a pricing point of view, but it doesn't fall to the level of the store brand goods. So the market share of the store brand goods goes up by quite a lot. So that's one of the big effects. Again, that's something that's interesting because it might differ in markets where they didn't have that kind of generic, cheaper brand. But so, so what you see is expenditure falls, but it falls by less than it did because of this pricing response. Quantity actually goes up. So expenditure falls, but quantity goes up, but because people are now facing lower prices and they're switching to the lower price goods. Um, so they, they're spending less, but they're getting more for what they're spending. So consumers are better off for that, but, they're, but given that the government's objective function was to reduce quantity, that's, um, you know, the, the consumers are better off because they're getting crisps for cheaper, but not in the way that the government, that, that's not achieving what the government wanted to achieve. Um, the probability of purchasing increases because the price has gone up, uh, gone down, and um, people substitute towards bigger pack sizes because the price of those has particularly gone down. So this uh, total effect, you know, almost the repricing 
more than mitigates for the effect of getting so so banning advertising has had the effect that was anticipated and the government wanted to achieve but the repricing the re-equilibrating of prices has worked in the opposite direction and completely mitigated the impact uh, on, on quantities um, and if we um, look at the so, so what does that mean for the quantities of like saturated fat and salt or the, uh, that we care about. So, that, so if we look at the, without the pricing response, these fall, uh, which was the aim of government. We led to a reduction in um, saturated fat and salt. And I could look at how that differed across different type of people. I haven't, I haven't shown those results here, but we do that in the paper. Um, but with the pricing response, the, uh, there's no change in saturated fat because of the increased quantity. So while people, and there's a slight increase in salt. So what consumers do is they substitute, because now they're paying more attention to the nutritional characteristic, they substitute to the healthier varieties. But because prices fall by so much, they increase the quantity. They increase the pack size and they increase the purchasing probability. So overall that's leading to you know, a shift towards more healthy varieties, but an aggregate increase because of the quantity increase. So that's by way of demonstrating that it's important. One, so, you know, why, what, what was important in what we did here was one, that the demand model was rich enough to capture all of those different effects. Um, and then we did the supply side. So if you just looked at this without the supply side, you get very different estimates. Okay, so what about the effect on welfare? Yeah. Uh, do you also incorporate cost of advertisement in your models? Cost of? Advertisement, cost yeah. of advertising. Yeah. Do you have that in the yeah, so it's a fixed cost to firms, yeah. Okay. So firms no longer bear that fixed cost. So that's one, one, one of the drivers in some of the decisions, but it's a fixed cost. So you observe the cost of advertising? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And, um, Secondly, I have a very hard time accepting the fact that under the counter factual that advertising is banned or the quantity goes up. Um, just from the point of view that that reduces competition and if you take it to its extreme and go into a monopolized setting, you probably have lower quantity overall consumed because of all types of monopolistic behavior. Um, Sorry, I didn't understand that. So uh, reducing advertising increases competition because now the so we used to have a couple of small brands that advertised a lot and then like a competitive fringe that was cheap and didn't advertise very much. And they had low market share because advertising led people not to pay too much attention to price and to put like a high premium on those expensive products. Now we get rid of advertising, the market's more competitive. No one exits, it's still profitable for everyone to stay in the market. And now those firms are competing more directly with each other. It's like we've reduced the extent of differentiation. If you just think of a standard hoteling model, we have two goods here, this good is here because it's being advertised. Now we get rid of the advertising, they move closer together. Now price competition is more tough. But I think this is more an artifact of the fact that you're assuming that people's preferences are not affected by advertising. Because if I think of, for example, cola, and if I, in my mind, if cola advertisements are banned, right? Coke can no longer advertise. I don't think that I would go to the supermarket and just buy store brand cola to the extent that my overall consumption of cola goes up. I think when cola is being advertised, Coca-Cola is being advertised, my preferences, my sense of margins change because I just tend to buy more cola. So do you think this is, is so, any proof? So I, d so I didn't understand whether what you just said is that you think there's a permanent effect of advertising on your preferences? Yes. So I, I want to ask the question, is there proof of this type of thing happening anywhere? Where if you ban advertising, total market size will actually gone up. Um, we haven't had very many bans on advertising and we don't have very many, and, and, and where we have had it, we don't have good control groups. So people have descriptively looked at that, but we don't really have any good evidence because we haven't seen that. I mean, that's one reason we're doing ex-ante evaluation. If we, did, if we had lots of nice experiments, we could look at it ex-post, but we don't have that ability right. to do I that. say that now your paper, people will be looking for, for this. To test that. So you're but you'd have to ban advertising in a way that gave you a good control group, which I don't know that we do. So the places where it tends to be done, it tends to be done in like a, with other policies at the same time, it leads to, um, reformulation, it 
uh, you know, other thing, other macro things are going on. So I'm not aware of places where we've seen it done where you actually like have a control group that you could compare to. Yeah, yeah. taken. But I just want to point out that that seems to be very significant. The fact that more on market sales going, and I take your argument, but I would want evidence before I accept. So that's an interesting particular counterfactual. Yep, great. So you cannot believe it if you want. But I mean, I think what I think what the so the point of this paper that I think is powerful is to say, uh, if you restrict the strategic space that firms can play in, they're going to play differently in the space you're not restricting. So I'm going to show you in the Coke case, this isn't what happened. So I'm going to do exactly the same thing for Coke, and you see a different outcome because the shape of demand is different. So in the case for Coke, uh, the market doesn't expand, it contracts. So it's not, this is not a universal truth at all. The, the demand estimates that we get here imply that this is what happens, that in this market, the nature of advertising is really uh, distortionary, and so that by getting rid of it, you do lead to more competition. In Coke and Pepsi, we don't see that. So, one would need to think about, so do you believe our demand estimates? There's all sorts of reasons that you might not believe them. Yeah. Um, and, and also this is the, so the other problem with doing this ex post is this is the long run effect. So again, in some appendix to the paper, we look at the transition. So how long is it gonna take that stock to go to zero? Could be quite a long time, that's what you're saying. Is it maybe in my lifetime, I still remember all those Coke ads and I'm never gonna forget them. Uh, so we're modeling here the complete new equilibrium transition where it's gone to zero. You could look at the dynamics over that time period and maybe there's some interesting things. I don't, we don't really think we have the ability to identify any of that here because we haven't seen those what transitions. You, about, you will show the results for both with the same type of approach and then the results over there are, are different. different. Yes. Yeah. No, great. absolutely. So, the, so what's key here is it's driven by the shape of demand. And so what's key for you to believe what I'm doing is that you believe I've done a good job yeah. at specifying demand. So like if you take one thing home from these three lectures, it's that. It's that you don't just sit there and 10, ten seconds write down a demand model and estimate it and interpret it in some way. That I'm trying to be really careful about that I have a demand model that has the richness to pick up potential different effects and that I can identify it well. If you believe that, then I think that this factor is at play here. So in any particular market, whether this dominates or not, I mean, this force is still at play in Coke, it's just other forces are also at play that lead it in the other direction. But I think it's pretty uncontroversial to think about just the fact that if firms have two strategic variables that they compete with and you get rid of one, they're going to compete differently in the other one. And if the effects of the market are such that, you know, that leads to an increase in rivalrousness, then that's going to drive prices down. And the structure of this market is such that that's what happens. So like in the Coke and Pepsi case, you also have the generic brands, but you don't see the same substitution to the generic brands at all. Here, they seem to be much closer substitutes, yeah, according to our model. This is like a strong point of data, I think you've done that, right? Because you, you have an approach and you see empirically that you have something which matches intuition in the market, where perhaps you believe something starting out, and then someone like me thinks that this is... Yeah. Not, not something that I would believe in, but then you say that here it doesn't. It's not, it doesn't happen in every market. It happens, yeah. And by the way, this isn't the paper that we set out to write. We set out to write a paper that showed, oh, let's show how big of an effect banning advertising is going to have. And then we're like, oh, actually, it doesn't. Wow, that's pretty surprising. <laughs> so we were surprised too. Um, but, but I think that that's the intuition of it, that the, the, you know, what you gain from it is not so much the numbers, it's the idea that this could happen and that one needs to think carefully about the market at play. Rachel, I know it's not this paper, but were you itching to know what the impact on producers is? If they could coordinate, if there are a way that they could commit to no advertising, yeah, no, so producers win here. Yeah, yeah, so produce this, it's like a, it's like a prisoner's dilemma game. It's like they would prefer. What happens? Like they, they sell less. Yeah, but I'll show you their profits in a minute. So, they, so they're better off. Uh, so they don't lose. But once they reprice, they can basically get back. I can't remember exactly here, but like the same. So in Coke and Pepsi, they lose. Here, I think they're kind of the same. I can't remember. We'll, we'll see in a minute, I think. Um, so yeah, again, that surprised us a bit. We're like, how could this be? So we checked whether for what, what are firms doing. 
And it is like, if, if advertising is purely rivalrous, it, there could equally be a reason that they want to get rid of it and that the government coordinating by banning it would be something they'd be perfectly happy with. That's pretty interesting, though, like from a political economy point of view about imposing these kind of bans because maybe they'll be much more acceptable to firms if that's true, right? right. Um, if they understood, right? If, yeah. Are yeah. Yeah. Right. Exactly, if they understood. Yeah. So what happens to welfare? So I said, we, that if, all, if we want to think about what happens to welfare, we have to take this view, like, what's the utility function that we need, we want to construct welfare on? And because we have this possibility about b it being distortionary, that's potentially problematic. So, um, this is a, just a fancy way of saying what we're going to do is, is think about there being, uh, so people make decisions based on the um, distorted preference, you know, the distorted decision utility, but we're going to evaluate the utility of those decisions based on their undistorted utility, right? And so when we think about, um, that's going to be kind of what this says here, is that if we want to think about the welfare implications, what we want to look at in the counterfactual world is what's the utility that the consumer gets using the utility function that's not distorted, that has advertising set to zero everywhere, but evaluated on the decision they made given that their preferences were distorted, right? And so we want to compare the experience utility in the state of the world where there's advertising so not the decision utility, but the experience utility on the decision they made, and then the experience utility in the other world. So that's going to mean that we have, um, we have the, the change in welfare from the policy has like two different effects. It has the effect of removing the distortion, and it has the effect of increasing price competition. And if one, let me just, I'm not totally sure I wrote this down. It, wait, so I didn't write this down, but if one thought about advertising as having um, being a characteristic that you valued, that choice distortion is like a law, a utility loss. It takes a slightly different form, but you're basically in the in the if if advertising is distortionary, I'm going to benefit from a ban because now I'm making decisions that are more in line with my true preferences, and then the effects of price competition are going to also be a benefit. Whereas in the world where it's a characteristic, I'm going to lose because I valued the advertising and now you're taking it away from me and then I'm going to benefit from the price. And so the sign of welfare depends crucially on which of those two it is. It's going to be either negative or positive depending on which assumption you make. Um, and so we can show the components of that under those two assumptions. So the choice distortion is a, is a large component. So let's just look at the, with the pricing response Consumers gain a lot by removing the distortion to their choices. And then they gain also from the increased price competition. But the bigger effect is from the choice distortion. And so total compensating variation goes up. Here we see the change in profits is like nothing. So firms are basically able to re... They, the, the reduction in the expenditure on advertising kind of fully compensates for the, um, for the um, benefits they got from that. So the change in welfare, if we take the view that advertising distortionary is quite large, if we um, oh, some of that goes the wrong way. If if we think of it as a characteristic, then people the first line tells us people lose the characteristic which they valued, they gain from the price competition effect, and so the overall effect is negative. Right, um, and so you know we I, I think this is more plausible, but the other is is a possibility. Um, so overall, we find that in response to introducing a ban in this market, advertising um, leads consumers to substitute to healthier options, um, and at constant prices, quantity would fall, but stronger price competition leads to lower prices and so increases quantity. Um, profitability of most of the mar in the market is unchanged. Some firms lose and gain a little bit, but it's basically not a big changes. Um, and if advertising is viewed as distorting consumer behavior, then total welfare would rise. But again, the big takeaway for me is, I mean, is that those results are possible, not so much that they're gonna happen in every market, but that it's possible and one would wanna think about the nature of the market. But two, that in order to find those, it was really important that we put in the flexibility into demand that we did. 
The one other point to make is that when we first started out writing this paper, we were kind of going to write the paper I'm going to talk about next, which is about solving the dynamic supply equilibrium. At that time, we didn't know how to do that. So we uh, just kind of thought, oh, there's no way we're going to ever solve this problem. And then one day, Pierre just sort of said, oh, but if we're banning it, all the supply dynamics go away. And you can have those kind of serendipitous good ideas that make turn a really complicated problem into something that actually you can make a lot of um, a lot of uh, progress on if you just think about you know carefully about what you're able to do. So that was sort of one of the big things we did in this paper. Yeah. It's very very common. We um, talk about welfare. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, Cons yeah. But how about the internet? Right? Oh yeah. So in the paper, yeah, exactly. So I haven't talked about that here in the paper. We talk, so like we can back out. So there's two things that we do in the paper that I didn't talk about here. Was one is you. Um, oh no, there's no taxes here actually. So no, sorry, I was we had confusing myself. Um, so you can back out what the. Um, No, you can't pack anything. What am I talking about? So you, the, the, there's another component of welfare that we haven't calculated here, which is the benefit in terms of internalities that we just haven't looked at here at all. Yeah, exactly. So in the, in the other papers, in the next paper, in the papers I talked about before, we usually at the end back out with a tax. You, uh, so there's winners and losers, and you could back out what the internality would need to be to make people not worse off. And those tend to be very small. So it's like completely, the, the policies are welfare improving in that sense. So we don't know what the size of internalities are, but we can say as long as the savings are you know, 10p per can of Coke or something, which seems like a small number, then, the, then everyone gains. Right? So in all those papers, we kind of do that at the end. I haven't focused on that here, but right, did but that make sense? Example, if they're eating more chips because prices have gone down. That's right. Oh, so there should be a negative component. Absolutely. Sorry. Yes. Sorry. Well, yeah. One would need to look at so they're eating healthier varieties, but they're eating more of them. So one would need to have a careful view of what internalities arise from that, which I have. You. Yeah. So there are models that allow you to do that. It's, it's we have. Yeah, no, that's right. So, so there are, um, like, health economists have models that say two grams of saturated fat leads to a 5% increase in the probability of a heart attack or whatever, and that has 10 qualities or whatever. So we could apply those weightings to this. We haven't done that here, but you, one could. I mean, all the mechanics are here to do that easily. But so you're right. The welfare is not including the internet. The internet. Yeah, no, absolutely, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, no, you're totally 100% right that there's going to be a... But I don't know what I would... I don't... Yeah, we'd have to know quite a lot about what... Yeah, and then it's a tricky question. The change in... So you... So oh, yeah, so what... So that's a different... That's a more complicated... Um, but here we have the change in... So even if it's only... So even saturated fat still falls because they're moving... It doesn't fall by as much, but it doesn't go up, but salt goes up. So you'd need to weight the, those and figure out what the weights of those are. So like that's, you know, we have that for every individual. And so like if we had an epidemiology model, we could do that. And, and one would want to do that for sure. That, that's not our expertise, but one would want to do that. Yeah. Great. Thanks. So I think we have an hour, hour and a half, is it? One. Okay. Four. Perfect. Okay, great. And just for anyone who missed it, the, if you look here, the slides are here, if anyone wants them. My nice picture of Singapore. So do you, do you work on these issues? Yeah. You obviously know enough about discrete choice demand that you must yeah, do. I, yeah, I really work on discrete choice demand. And yeah. So like, actually, I'm getting a lot of help from your lectures. Good. So I'm not a, com I'm a computer science student. I'm oh, not okay. A, um, I'm, I, I work with Susan at Stanford. Uh -huh. You might know Susan. Oh, yeah. Um, but I, 
I primarily do machine learning research. Oh yeah. With with causal inference models. Oh yeah. 